enga mana, enga waka, enga reo, e rau rangi tira mā, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Buenas tardes and good afternoon to you all. I am Bronwyn Kelly, I'm the Deputy Chief Executive of Universities New Zealand Te Pokai Tara, which is the peak body, the representative body of all eight of New Zealand's universities. And I'm delighted to be chairing this panel that focus, focuses specifically on research connections between New Zealand and Chile. Our panel is gonna be a fairly large panel, so bear with us. Uh, it comprises eight researchers representing each of New Zealand's eight universities to shed light on just some of the active research connections that we have in Chile across the disciplines, including the humanities and the sciences. I'd like to invite the six panel members, and I am hoping we do have six today because I believe some flights were cancelled, but I'd like the, to invite the six panel members who are here in person today to make their way up to the stage, um, and I'll introduce them all. Good. We have a few, a couple, I believe, on Zoom. And once I've introduced them all, I'll ask each panel member a question. Um, and uh, time permitting, then I'll open up uh, to the floor for questions from the audience. <coughs> right, and do we have our two Zoom panel members as well? Ah, there we are. Kia ora. So, on Zoom, we have Associate Professor Waleska Pino Ojeda, who is the director of the New Zealand Centre for Latin American Studies at the University of Auckland, and Associate Professor Chris Lusk from the School of Science at the University of Waikato. In person, we have Professor Kerry Taylor, who is the head of the School of Humanities at Massey University, <coughs> Dr. Moira Fortin Cornejo, who is a lecturer in the Department of Languages and Cultures at the University of Otago. Dr. Claudio Aguayo, who is the Director of Research and Development at the App Lab at the Auckland University of Technology. <laughs> Professor Hugh Higsby, Bigsby, sorry, uh, who is the Dean of the Faculty of Agribusiness and Commerce at Lincoln University. <laughs> Professor Joe Zuccarello, from the School of Biological Sciences, Te Herenga Waka, Victoria University of Wellington, and Dr. Gabriella Rolden from Gateway Antarctica, who is representing the University of Canterbury and the Antarctic Heritage Trust. Waleska, lucky first, I might start with you. Um, you came to New Zealand with an American PhD in the early 1990s. Um, and have kept your research links with your Chilean homeland very active, most notably through directing your university's New Zealand Centre for Latin American Studies for many years. How have your research interests evolved over the years, and what has been the greater influence on them, your academic location in this country, or the developments in Chile? Kia Thank you for the opportunity and the invitation and being part of this incredible, incredible event. If you allow me, I really would like to start with a very small anecdote because I think that that anecdote is really what has shaped in many ways my position as a Chilean academic in New Zealand. Yes, I arrived to New Zealand in 1996 directly from the United States from having defended my PhD thesis at the University of Washington in Seattle. Uh, so I just defended the PhD three days before. <laughs> so I arrived here and I had the fortune to meet my, my lovely colleagues, Matthew Oma and Catherine Lehman, who had just one year earlier inaugurated the, New Zealand, the Latin American Studies program at the University of Auckland. So I came to join them in that mission. When I arrived in 1996, the ambassador of Chile to New Zealand was Fernando Reyes Mata, 
who was actually initiating his career as a diplomat. He was the most delightful person and I feel absolutely fortunate to have had the opportunity because he was very much interested in cultural diplomacy. And in that capacity, he established very close linkages with our very new program. During those conversations, he, he, he basically commented and shared an anecdote of which I haven't found the historical record, but as an anecdote, it makes perfect sense. It goes as follows. He said that the relations between New Zealand and Latin America were established, of course, 50 years ago, in the context of Salvador Allende's government implementing a very central program to control the malnutrition in Chile. Allende established the program of half liter of milk for every child in Chile. And at that moment, New Zealand was very much looking for markets for their dairy products in the context of basically the European markets and, and England joining that market. So when New Zealand, and this is the way he mentioned that, he narrated this anecdote, the New Zealanders, when they heard that this country over there is going to be giving half a liter of milk to every child in the country, they paid attention. And he said, oh, oh, this people is going to need a lot of milk. And for me, that's such a beautiful anecdote because if I think carefully, <laughs> if I think carefully, it's not probably, as you say, odd uh, to think that in my tender years when I was in primary school in the 70s, I actually received New Zealand milk in my school breakfast. And it's such a beautiful way for me to feel integrated with the history of New Zealand, the relationship we have in, this, in the Southern Hemisphere, and the enormous affinities that I have developed with New Zealand. My research specializations have been mainly focused on the, on the culture and the, and the role of, of cultures and the arts in processes of redemocratization, very much in, inspired by the reality of my own country, of course, Chile, in the context of state terrorism, social trauma, but most importantly, or equally important, in the context of neoliberalism. Obviously, New Zealand doesn't share the social trauma and the and state terrorism, but we do share neoliberalism as a very general template that has been defining our lives in Chile since 1976 and in New Zealand since the early 80s. That has been fundamental for me to establish myself as a scholar. And of course, this line of analysis using Chile as a study case, as a template, has been fundamental in the establishment of our program, the New Zealand, the Latin American Studies Program, the New Zealand Center for Latin American Studies 2003, of which I became the director, I've been the director since 2007, and the establishment of our PhD in Latin American Studies in 2016. 16, and in that program, we have four students, two, two of them are Chilean and are coming here to study also in this line, including indigenous studies and learning from the New Zealand experience. That would be my answer for that question so far. Thank you, Waleska. Good to know that our dairy products travel that far. <laughs> <laughs> Kiri, I'm going to turn to you now. Um, you are the head of a dynamic group at Massey engaging with Latin America across the humanities. I've got a couple of questions for you. Uh, and can you please share some of the main foci of your interactions with Chile? And what themes are your partners there most interested in exploring with peers in New Zealand? Uh, kia ora, everybody. Uh, Buenos tardes. Uh, that's the uh, extent of both my Tereo and my uh, Spanish. So I, I, I come here as a fraud from the humanities. <laughs> but it's, it's important for humanities to be here because we actually have something very important to say. So um, I just want to start a little bit of um, the broader con connections between our university and Chile in terms of research. And that's been driven almost entirely by agriculture. So the milk that's been described was probably produced either in Chile or New Zealand with the help of Massey scientists. So the, the number of, and Lincoln, sorry. 
excuse my alter ego, my alter ego from the South Island. <laughs> we'll spar later. Um, so, of the 140 odd co-publications in the last five years between our university, 95% of those have been science. So about 5% have been humanities and social science. So very much, uh, in my sense, that we're the beginners in that space. So humanities has an opportunity space there. So we're starting that conversation. Um, so in terms of how we've done that in the last couple of years, we've focused very much on local activities. So we've hosted a few scholars. Uh, we've had a Mapuche scholar from uh, Universidad Austral who worked on the way in which New Zealand teachers were teaching STEM subjects, particularly to uh, indigenous uh, students. Mm -hmm. We've hosted um, Chilean school teachers who've been learning about TESOL, uh, English as a second language. Um, and uh, the, the biggest project was one that the uh, ambassador mentioned earlier in his introduction, uh, a collaboration of uh, poetry. Um, this is an artifact which I think tells a lot about the potential as well as what we're actually starting to do now. So this is a book of poems, so that in itself I think is quite important. It's not all about economic things, it's about cultural relations, about knowing each other, sharing stories, and stor poetry is very much about storytelling. Uh, the book was uh, translated from Spanish into English and then Te Reo, so that in itself is a, a conversation starter. Um, I think it's a unique project that we've got a lot of uh, work to do to follow on the potential <coughs> that this shows us for understanding each other in each other's language and connecting the stories, connecting the language together. The other part of this which is really important I think is that this is designed specifically to go to schools in New Zealand. So with the embassy, uh, Massey, our school, uh, of humanities, media and creative communication. It's expanded since it was originally named. Um, we we uh, are working together to put uh, a copy of this book in each school in New Zealand and it's actually so popular that we're going for a second print run. It's not for sale, it's the gift, it's a cultural kind of gift in that sense. So um, the, the, the volume is uh, something that uh, came from the ambassador we hatched the idea uh, at the Latin American uh, Spanish Film Festival in Palmerston North in 2021. So it was a year in the making. Juan A. Morris uh, from our Te Patai, uh, School of Māori Studies was here, but I think he may have had to slip out to feed the parking meter. Um, it's, it's a cultural experience that most people in Wellington will understand and love. <laughs> There's probably a Spanish way of saying that. Um, I won't try. Um, so it was a collaboration with our partners on the ground and I think one of the takeaway points apart from the importance of culture uh, and language in these interactions is using local partnerships. It's not all about building partnerships with Chile across the ditch, across the sea. Uh, it's also building opportunities close at hand and I'd like to thank the uh, Chilean Embassy for being very insistent, very persistent, very generous partners uh, in this project. Um, so the, the last thing I'd say really is that for humanities, and I, I'd be interested to hear what the situation is with other schools, quite a few of the initial connections between uh, us have been through personal contacts, either uh, Chilean uh, staff themselves or people who have a Chilean connection. And I think we need to build on that, but we need to move beyond those. So that's where our school's hoping to head in the next little phase, to expand and uh, take up the opportunities to engage actively with Chile. Wonderful, thank you, Kerry. Thank you for your storytelling, much appreciated. <coughs> Moira, I'm going to turn to you now. Um, you've published a book um, on theatre in Rapa Nui, Easter Island. Can you please share with us the origins of this research, beginning with your personal connection to Rapa Nui, and have you found any synergies with work on Māori theatre here in New Zealand? <coughs> How much time do we have? <laughs> Three to four minutes. Okay. <laughs> I'll, keep it, I'll keep it short. So, kia ora koutou. Hola, buenas tardes. Thank you very much for the invitation to this amazing um, event. Um, so, where did it start? That started in the 70s. So, I've been connected to Rapa Nui through family relations since before I was born. 
um, my grandmother decided she was an amazing woman. She was a traveler. Um, and one day, why not, she decided to visit this island. And they went on a cargo ship. And the deal was you stay there for as long as the ship stays there. It could be six months, it could be two weeks, depending on weather. She stayed for a number of years. <laughs> Um, when she came back to Santiago, rather when she went back to Santiago, uh, she became a foster parent to Rapa Nui students who did not have anywhere to go over long weekends or a week long um, holidays. So um, in the meantime, my aunt, who still lives in Rapa Nui, moved there and she has been living there for the last 30 years. And then one year she invited me over <laughs> to go and I was like, hell yeah, yes, pick me. So I went there literally out of curiosity. I really wanted to see what was it with this place that has a, such a strong hold and influence in my family. And I stayed there for 12 years. <laughs> um, as a recent graduate of um, theater studies, I'm an actor, uh, graduated from Universidad Católica in Santiago. Um, I arrived in Rapa Nui with a strong sense of, yes, let's save the universe through theater. We can do this. Armed with a number of books um, of well-known theater um, writers, playwriters, from Shakespeare all the way to Radrigan and Grifero, well-known Chilean authors. And students there were like, and? So I really failed to engage um, and inspire students to be creative because they wanted to tell their own stories in their own particular way. So if you can go against them, you join them. So I joined a dance troupe that was performing for tourism and there I learned the language, the culture, the history the oral narratives, protocols, how to do things, um, customs, all sorts of things. At home, I was living with my aunt and her husband, my uncle, Rapa Nui uncle, he was hammering down Rapa Nui language like forever. So I was fully immersed. And as a, and as a theater person, I could see how this culture was so performative in so many ways. So, and then again, Storytelling is huge. They're, they're an oral culture, so they tell stories not just through spoken word, they tell stories through dances, through songs, through recitations, through body paintings. In each of those aspects, tell a different side of the story, a different part of the story. So when you look at theater, you need to look for all those symbols and metaphors. If you just listen to the spoken word, you're gonna get the tip of the iceberg. If you know everything else, you're gonna go deep in synergies with Maori. <laughs> oh, the motivations for doing theater. Early stages of Maori theater was revitalization of um, Maori language. Um, being able to, talk, to tell their own side of the story in terms of colonial histories and also creating work for Maori performers and Pacifica performance as well, because Maori theater was a strong influence in Samoan theater performed here in New Zealand. Um, and also how the tradition is, has become a springboard from where to produce and create something new that speaks to 21st century audiences, indigenous audiences, what are they facing, what are their issues, what are they struggling with, and what are they celebrating as well? That's me. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you, Moira. Thank you for sharing such a personal story. Much appreciated. Uh, Claudio, uh, forgive my back as I talk into the microphone. Um, as a more recent arrival from Chile into our New Zealand university system, your work examines the design and the application of digital technologies for learning in a range of educational settings. Since you've been in New Zealand, have you found particular areas of your work that resonate strongly across both societies? 
Kira Koto Katoa. It is a pleasure to be here to share this panel with you and to share my experience. Um, thank you for the question. I believe, um, so I work at the App Lab, which is a hub of innovation and uh, where we explore new technologies in education. The goal is to understand how to actually use uh, technology in a way that enhances and promotes education, not to replicate traditional forms of education with new technology. And that's the point of difference. And that's what um, actu actually answers the question. We explore new ways of conceiving technology in the classroom, outside the classroom, at home, etc. And that's what people seek uh, from us. How to use technology in a way that works. And we get interest from everyone, from um, institutions in New Zealand, from academics in um, Chile, for example, the ministers um, mentioned to two academics uh, visiting New Zealand will come to the App Lab to learn from us in terms of how to use technology in not only the classroom, but to promote um, a transformative type of education as we see it. So just to add to that, I guess, um, I, I have a biology background. I studied biology at the University of, uh, of Chile in Santiago, the same school where Humberto Maturana teached and um, studied. So I, I feel um, I represent that school of thought. And it is that school of thought that combined with creativity and innovation that is part of the culture here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, when you combine those two, magic happens. Because there's new ways of conceiving or philosoph philosophizing technology, but at the same time, we, we apply them. And, and that's the fun part of my job, is to play with technology and to see what works. And when we know what works and how it works, we take it to the practice, we take it to the classroom, to, to where we or where people want the technology. And I think, um, yeah, that, that's what people seek from us. And um, I just want to comment uh, further on one thing. I, I was lucky enough to be at the Oakland uh, Mini Summit last week, and here, uh, to them here. And I keep hearing this relationship between um, Chile and New Zealand being old in, in many ways, but no one, uh, and I'm sorry if I'm stepping into the sciences um, panel, no one has really mentioned that, or I haven't heard so far in this context, that we were together once when we were uh, in Gondwana, in the macro continent. Chile and New Zealand actually shared the same land. And when we started to diverge, to diverge that's when um, I believe our common ancestor uh, took different routes. Uh, excuse me, Karen, can I borrow your book? When I, when I look at this book, I actually see a reference to that. We can see closely, there's two trees there. The Araucaria, the Monkey Paso, and the Cauri. We know in science that Monkey Paso, the Araucaria, and the Cauri are related, they're cousins. And so, all, many other species. So, I work at the um, Potama, the Faculty of Maori and Indigenous Development at the uh, AUT. And as some of my Maori colleagues say, as Maori, uh, in, in their words, uh, we fuck up Papa to not only Rapa Nui, but actually to Mapuche people, for example. They refer to Mapuche people as the old, old, old cousins, but that some, sometimes, someday were, you know, walking together maybe not as humans, maybe as another type of uh, organisms, we don't know. But that that's, uh, has meaning, right? And that's what motivates me in building bridges between the two, the two countries. Yeah, thank you. Brilliant, thank you, Claudio. You provided um, the perfect segue from the humanities uh, into the sciences. Um, so now we turn to Hugh. Hugh, um, besides being, being the Dean of Lincoln's Agricultural Facu Agribusiness Faculty, um, your research interests include resource management and the economics of biosecurity. Can you please explain to everyone here, what is it about the physical environment in both countries that invites bilateral collaborations? So I'm not actually the scientist, I'm an economist, but the, the bridge between the two 
and, uh, and, and, and you know, they continue the segue. So it's Nothofagus is the other one. That's the common species. I think Lenga in southern Chile, Argentina. So beech tree, same history in, in the past. So, so for me, the, 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 the segue from sciences and, and, and humanities is all science has a context. It has a society, institutions, culture, climate, environment that all science gets carried out in. And, and, and so for me, where the magic happens when you're collaborating with other people is this, the fundamental science is kind of all the same. It's how you use it and how you interpret it and how it gets applied in different areas. And so my experience, um, you know, the things you mentioned, environment, I'm, I'm actually a forest economist by training, so it's, it's all about managing things for people um, and for the environment. So the things that we work on all the time are people coming together because we have common background in sort of a technical sense, but we're solving problems that have a unique set of circumstances in the place that you happen to be in at the time. Um, for me, um, 2019, I think, one of the last when you could travel to Chile, um, I uh, w spoke at a conference uh, hosted by Feta Fruta, and the real interest there was um, not the science from New Zealand, uh, it was a horticulture-based conference, but it was how uh, how business in New Zealand organizes itself, the food and fiber industries, in terms of generating science, um, generating knowledge, um, how farmers work together. They don't have the equivalent of our levy-funded funded bodies, uh, much more fragmented research environment. And so you get these kind of things where what, what starts to pull people together is this... Um, trying to solve problems where, where people are bringing different experiences from the environment that they, they work in where they're applying their science. So I'll just leave it there. Thank you, Hugh. Um, Chris, um, are you still with us? Yes, great, super. Um, Chris, you're an ecologist who has worked mostly in forests and has worked in Chile on forest dynamics and plant ecology. What took you to Chile in the first place and how have you maintained your connections with your Chilean peers over the years? Good afternoon. Um, and in Chile, um, it's, I guess it's muy buenas noches. Um, um, but it, it was those southern connections that Claudio has already mentioned in, in his talk. Um, <clears throat> when I was a, a PhD student at Auckland University, I, I came across a, um, what I'd describe as a thrilling series of papers written by um, <clears throat> an American geographer um, who spent four years in Chile at the Universidad Austral studying <clears throat> the dynamics of the Valdivian rainforest. And so, um, <clears throat> curiously, he actually came to New Zealand after he'd finished in Chile. He spent two years in, in New Zealand as a postdoc. So he was, he's kind of the pioneer, of one of the pioneers of these Southern Connections, you might say, which is in the 1970s. <clears throat> and um, I was fascinated to, to see in these papers that um, some of our native trees had, had very close relatives over in Chile. Native trees like, um, <clears throat> of course, the Southern Beaches. <clears throat> and um, Tōtara um, and, and our Kamahi, they all had close relatives over in Chile. But, but they were behaving in these papers, it was apparent that, that these trees are sometimes behaving in a somewhat different way over there. And um, <clears throat> I found this fascinating and I was, um, thought, well, I've got to get over there. And I was sufficiently motivated to enroll in a, in a, in a Spanish class immediately. <clears throat> and I started learning Spanish and enjoyed it immensely. And um, <clears throat> I eventually did get to Chile by a somewhat circuitous route on a bit of an adventure and um, <clears throat> stayed for a while and ended up being offered a job at a Chilean university at the Universidad de Talca. And I, yeah, I spent more than 12 years working in Chile at, at Chilean universities, um, researching forests over there and, and teaching. And I have to say that maintaining connections has been easy. Um, I'm, um, 
I've been back to Chile several times since I left. So I have friends over there and, and research connections as well. And um, I'm currently collaborating with two of my former students, um, people who, who students who uh, people who studied um, in my laboratory when I was at uh, Universidad de Concepcion. So they're both involved in a, a current research project. We've got um, um, my current project is funded by the Royal Society of New Zealand, and we're, we're looking at forest succession on landslides in Chile, New Zealand, and Tasmania, um, involving researchers from all three regions. So um, again, what these three regions have in common is, is similar southern temperate forests with southern beaches. Like you, you can see, you can see behind me, I'm in a, um, a southern beach forest in the Wairarapa in New Zealand. And you'll find very similar forests in some parts of Chile and some parts of Tasmania. So that's that's a sort of my my Chilean connection in brief. Thank you, Chris. Um, Joe, back in the room. Um, your School of Biological Sciences at Te Hereinga Waka, Victoria University of Wellington, has received great students from Chile in the past. Um, and you and your colleagues maintain connections with your former PhD students who are now working there in top um, universities in Chile. Can you explain why marine biologists in the two countries find so many themes they can collaborate on? Separated uh, our land masses, uh, but being marine biologists, uh, we think of the ocean as being something that connects our land masses. Uh, with the west wind drift, there's lots of things in common between us. So it's not as so much a separation as a commonality. Uh, the ocean for ocean organisms is not really a barrier; it's just a place to live. Uh, so there's lots of things in common between New Zealand and Chile, same species. Um, it's a very closely related species. And so a while ago, we had quite a few uh, specialized PhD scholarships for Chileans, and they came to university, and many of them uh, came to Victoria, and many of them were marine biologists. And uh, because we had interests in the same sort of questions and organisms that they have in Chile. And so they came to New Zealand, and uh, they were, uh, all of them, amazing students and they raised the standard of our other students and uh, both because of the fact that there was a competitive scholarship and back to the fact that they were trained in Chile um, they were really quite amazing and almost all of them went back to Chile and got jobs in Catolica and Valdivia and Concepcion and so we continue to have collaborations with them uh, with my student in Concepcion and others, um, both in understanding the marine environment and conservation of marine environment, uh, even exploitation of the marine environment for, aquacul for aquaculture, so in different aspects of marine biology, uh, because of the fact that they've came here and uh, were able to start these collaborations. And so hopefully one day these uh, scholarships will come back and we'll continue to have these collaborations. Super, thank you, Joe. Gosh, I'm certainly learning a lot about the similarities between our two countries. That's wonderful. Gabriella, lucky last. <laughs> um, Christchurch and Chile's Puntos Arenas are two of the five gateway cities um, to the Antarctic. As a result, researchers in both countries have multiple connections through Antarctic research and policy. Can you please give us an example of those connections and how they have taken you to Chile in the past? Yes, thank uh, you. Thank you. Uh, kia ora, Kato. Buenas tardes a todos. Eh, muchas gracias por la invitación de participar en este panel. Um, I am a social scientist, but I am at the end of the science panel here because I was part of a multidisciplinary project that took many of us to Chile in collaborating with our Chilean counterparts. Uh, as many of the Chilean audience here knows, Punta Arenas is the capital of the Magallanes region y Antarctica Chilena, and therefore there is a, a very strong connection with the Antarctic. 
topic. I just want you to think about uh, the map of the world in a different way. Instead of this sort of flat earth that uh, we see usually, just bring Antarctica to the fore and to the middle. And you will see that uh, both New Zealand and uh, Chile are very close, very, very close. And we are connected through the Southern Ocean that you commented. We are connected through the same origins of Gondwana. And we're also connected by having this very close Southern neighbor, the Antarctic. I look at Antarctica and how people connect with this Southern continent and the Southern region. And mostly I started looking at geopolitics because it's just so strong and prominent. I come from Tierra del Fuego, but from the other side of the Andes, so don't hold that against me. However, I, I feel I understand the way Chile looks at Antarctica because of coming from a very small place where Antarctica is just such a huge influence. In this uh, research, we looked at uh, how people look at Antarctica from the gateway cities. And there was the incre incredible similarities between Christchurch and also Punta Arenas. Not only uh, having this close by neighbor, being a coastal city, but mostly the people of these cities are concerned about climate change, sea level rise, they want a seat at the table. Usually, all these discussions about Antarctica management, the future of Antarctica, they get discussed at a very high level, somewhere far, far away from the actual place. And people from these cities, they feel connected. They want to know more. Now, I just want to bring back the uh, theme of today's panel between the academic exchanges that we have between New Zealand and Chile. It's quite high, as you can see, it's very strong. However, the populations of these cities, they want more. Uh, Antarctica, for example, is a place that was um, designed or, um, d sorry, uh, uh, left for, for, um, for the um, wealth of, the, of humankind. So it was for peace, science, international collaboration. However, the people that are closest and most connected to it don't have any say on what happens there. Antarctica becomes this elitist place where academics, diplomats, or people with a lot of money can visit. Whereas the ones that are closest by heart and by geography are excluded from understanding what happens there. So this is just slightly, uh, like um, Moira said, the tip of the iceberg of all the possibilities. Education, particularly Antarctic education, is very, very important. And I went for, with a fellowship to Punta Arenas and spent five months there learning from uh, my Chilean colleagues and creating really strong uh, relationships with them, which they stand until today. Unfortunately, the pandemic stopped some of the collaborations, but we're hoping that they will continue very soon. Thank you. Thank you, Gabriella, and you stole my closing words. So <laughs> thank you, you did a, did a wonderful job. Um, I'm just looking at the time now, and I think we'll just bring this session to a close. Um, uh, I'm sorry that you won't have time to ask them um, questions, but uh, please feel free during the afternoon tea to ask any of our panel members questions. Um, I'm sure they'd be delighted to talk to you. So that brings this session to a close, um, and I'd like you to please join me in thanking these panel members for their participation as they leave the stage. And um, we wish you all very well in your ongoing collaborations with Chile. Tēnā tato katoa. Um, I'll hand over now to Matthew for his presentation on the data visualization tool.